Um, good afternoon, everyone. Good morning, depending on where you are. Um, good evening. Uh, this session is something titled Digital Collections as Product. Um, I'm Dan Brennan. I'm the museum application developer at the Princeton University Art Museum, where I've been for five years. Um, and this is a campfire session. This is something that is going to involve a little bit of presenting from myself and David. Um, but hopefully, we really want this to also be an open conversation um, that people can participate in. That was, that was our goal here. A little background about how we got here. Um, this is one of those sessions that, you know, have been thinking about a little bit and kind of pulled together in response to a particular project that I've been working on that I'm going to talk about very briefly. Um, but really, the overall thing is that myself and David, too, I think I can speak for him in this sense, are people who think a lot about how museums present digital collections um, on the web. And we, th we think, a lot them, think about them a lot, both from the perspective of how do we do that? But also maybe more importantly, we think about why we do that and who we do it for. And the ways that the answers to those questions inform the end products that we build, uh, both in the sense that the end products that we've worked on in the past, but also how those things evolve over time. Um, and so this is, this is something that we know that a lot of other people are working on or working adjacent to. And we really wanted to, in the spirit of, even though this is a virtual conference, try to recreate that kind of atmosphere of Let's get together all the people we know who, who work on this kind of similar thing, and we can just talk about it and throw ideas together. And so, so that said, that's kind of the background of this. Um, I'll pass it on to David so David can introduce himself, um, and we'll introduce sort of some structure to this. Great. Hi, I'm David Newbury. I'm the head of software at Getty. Um, and as Dan said, this is something that he and I, and I know a lot of others, as I go through this list, are also thinking about. Um, what are we doing with collections? What does it mean to have that sort of structure in this day and age? What does it mean? And so we wanted to have that conversation, but we wanted to put some, some guardrails around that conversation because collections, we all think about collections all the time and there are all sorts of things we could talk about. Um, and so I think what we really wanna talk about in this session is the form and delivery of collections material and that information on the internet. Um, there's a lot of really interesting things we can talk about, you know, how does this work? But we wanted to say there have been other great sessions given by some of the people in this room around the content of collections. Um, that's not something we're gonna talk about here. Um, we're also not going to talk really about the language that we use to communicate that collections information. Um, that's a conversation that we're having internally. I know many other people are. It's a really good and important conversation, but it's not this conversation. Um, and finally, copyright and fair use is another one of those things that is top of mind for me constantly as we work through these issues. Um, there are other people who are more qualified and should talk on that. Um, so we really want to talk about collections online as how does that structure influence what we're doing? So I'll turn it back over to Dan. Thanks, David. Um, yeah, all of, all of that said, um, I, I alluded to a project that has been going on at Princeton, and this is the project that sparked this conversation. This is something that at Princeton we are calling Collections 2.1. Before I even dive into this, I should probably explain what Collections 2.0 was. Um, collections 2.0 was a multi-year project that began about five years ago, wrapped up about three years ago, to re-architect the entire way that we deliver collections to the web. This was largely a technical project from a content perspective. Um, the modifications, I won't say were superficial, but they were not dramatic. What we delivered at the end of that project was pretty similar to what we delivered at the beginning of it. The project is more about how we did that. Collections 2.1 is something that's a little more interesting from a content perspective. This was a multi-year IMLS funded project to bring together all of our unstructured and orphaned collections content into that existing framework that we had built the years before. What does that mean? That means vid video, audio, unstructured text pulled from print publications in some cases, all kinds of things that relate to the collections that the museum holds and really document how we think about them, but that exist outside of the structures that we had been relying on, primarily a collection information system to, to deliver that to the web. From a technical perspective, this project was interesting, but in the end, pretty straightforward. Um, you're just grabbing data from different places, modeling it somehow and delivering it through some kind of front end framework. The concept behind it was also pretty straightforward. Put everything we can offer about the collection, 
um, and this is sort of a brand term that we use in here, the collection, where people can see it, understanding that we have a singular place where we want to aggregate all of that, and that's the place that we expect and know that people go to. But then conceptually, this was challenging and not quite so straightforward. Because the immediate question that gets raised when you start thinking about these things is, where does the collection begin and end exactly? Um, and that was something that we didn't think a whole lot about before we started this project, but that every as we moved along and every time we uncovered something, we had to ask ourselves. I'm just giving a quick example here, um, some screenshots of that encapsulate kind of the overall problem we are trying to solve. The museum produces beautiful videos that document things that the museum does. This is an example of one. Um, it's a conservation project um, with a well-known piece of artwork on campus. This is an iconic piece of artwork. It was a very expensive conservation project. It was documented very well. So we made this video, we put it up on our webpage. People can view it. This is the page from our online collection that documents this object. At the start of this project, there would have been no connection between this and this. And so if we understand that scholars, researchers, people who are interested in the art that we have at the museum are relying upon the online collection to get a sense for what we know about those works of art, then this is a problem that we had to solve. Um, and so we did solve it so that now those things are merged. And in this case, I think it's a fairly straightforward answer. But then extend the problem to things like materials that have been produced for K to 12 groups that come to the museum. Extend, extend the problem to audio files that document a lecture that talks about this object for 30 seconds. Which of these things meet the criteria of being about the collection? And in the end, I think we sort of decided, you know, most of it did, but we grappled with a lot of questions before we got there. So here are some of those things that we had to answer. Um, and we haven't answered these definitively. And what we've come to understand is that over time and dealing with different aspects of the collections, these answers may change, they probably will. Things like who is the online collection for? If we answer that first question, what do they expect? We are a research university. We talk a lot about academic interest in the collection. We talk a lot about faculty and students, but we also know those are not the only people our museum serves. Those are not the only people our museum website serves. So the question then becomes, who are we as an institution and how does institutional identity factor into this? We are Princeton, capital P, Ivy League, but also is that how we want to present ourselves to every single resident of the internet? Do we wanna make ourselves seem inaccessible inadvertently in the interest of embracing our institutional identity? And further to that, as context for all of this, we are in the midst of a gigantic building project um, that's going to last several years. And so we are technically between two museums. We are between two museum buildings, but that also means we're between two museum identities, and this is ever shifting. And so if we make decisions around these questions relative to our online collections right now, how are these gonna to change tomorrow and beyond? And how do we have to future-proof both the technologies we use and the approach so that we can rapidly change those to meet the needs of our audiences. So that's my, my project in a nutshell. Um, and we could talk about many different aspects of that could serve as presentations of their own. But that said, I'm gonna turn it over to David now, who I think has his own version of this project. Yeah. And so we are also going into a, um, I think you went back to slide down. Sorry about that. No worries. We're also going into our own new collections project here that we're working on at Getty um, and, and wrestling with the same questions. We have a perfectly serviceable collection online that has lots of interesting data, has good high resolution images. Um, and, but it's also about seven years old and a lot has changed between seven years ago when we built it and now. And so when we said we're going to build out we're going to update these pages. We didn't want to just do a facelift. Um, they certainly need a facelift. But what we wanted to say were, what were the problems that we were trying to solve by doing a new collection? And, and it really asked the same questions that Dan is asking. What is the collection for? And we said, 
The main goal of the collection is to serve as that central place to present what we know about the objects that we have in custody. Um, it does have to be pretty, it has to align with that brand, and that brand gets really complicated, as Dan was saying. Um, we also know people wanted images. We also know that we had some issues around complexity. Um, you know, manuscripts are different than paintings, which are different than pottery fragments. Um, I like to tell people that the problem with working at a museum is that we have 150,000 unique snowflakes and every one is different. Um, it's different than the problem we have with our library. Um, but that the real goal of what, one of the real goals of what we were doing with our collection was to help users find things that were both interesting and relevant um, to what they were doing. That it had to really focus on how people use this, not necessarily just us presenting. Next slide. And so what we ended up doing was really saying, you know, and we've had this conversation across the field, that we end up with enthusiasts and professionals, both of whom end up using collection. But that what Collection Online really needed to be in our ecosystem was this central hub because there were so many access points that people would come to to find the collection that were connected somehow. You know, our audio guides connect to the collection. The work we do on Google Arts and Culture does. Um, our blog and our news articles, our news and stories section does. When we do exhibitions, those connect down to the collection. Um, when we do digital experiments, search and social media, um, and for professionals, they often come directly to the collection looking for information, but they also come through conservation project documentation or through lesson plans. And what it said, much like Dan was saying, is there's all of this ancillary information that surrounds our collection. That it, the collection can't do all the things that these do, but it still needs to be that central hub of information for what we're doing. Next slide. And the other things that we learned are the way our object pages as they exist now don't function this way. They are dead ends. You get to that object description, you read that object description, you learn something, and then you close the window because there's nowhere else to go. Um, but that's not true of the data. They're connected and they're connected through people and places and events and building out that network, that ecosystem of relationships, um, transitioning the work that we do from thinking about the collection as documentation about objects and more documentation of the network of information that we have and present is critical to making this work. Um, one of the things we learned in the research we were doing on this is we have a really fancy advanced search and the main user of that is our staff. Um, something like 90% of the searches that are done on our site are keyword searches. Um, and the other major search is uh, search by a session number which is clearly a staff driven thing or a publication thing. Um, and what we said coming out of this, we ended up identifying for those two user groups, two paths that we saw. For our non-experts, people who weren't coming here to do a job, um, they were interested in the image and they were interested in context around that image. Um, they didn't think of it necessarily as an object as much as a beautiful picture of something. And they wanted to know a little bit more about it and to find other things that inspired them because of those images. And for experts, they want that comprehensive information because they're always searching for that one fact that they've either forgotten or they don't know. But what they really want are paths out to other sources of knowledge. They're, they're trying to research something almost entirely. And they wanna know what else do we know that can send them out to other places. Maybe it's inside our Getty ecosystem, but maybe it's in the community writ large. And so as we thought through this set of problems, I think Dan and I both recognized that we're not really thinking about how do we redesign a web page that displays information pulled from TMS on the web. We're really thinking about how does a collection online function on the internet in 2021, not as a not as a separate thing from, or, or not as a, a digital representation of the museum experience, but as a thing that exists online and needs to function online as its own unique sort of entity. Um, I do not have, I don't have answers to how this all works, but I have a lot of really good questions. And if there's a group of people that I'd wanna talk about that with, this is probably that group. And so Dan, I think we are, to the questioning part. 
Thanks, David. Yes, we have we've gotten to the questions. Um, and this is this is the point at which you know we have four questions that David and I have identified. They are not certainly the only questions, but they're the ones that that we put our put our heads together and thought about. Um, so we'll walk through these, but primarily this is the point at which we want to turn this into a conversation and talk about sort of what the experiences of this room are, how they align with the experiences that David and I have, how they align with the experiences that we've learned about from other similar conference presentations and things like that. So the first of these is collections as more than your org chart. And David alluded to this quite a bit, which is how do we move beyond a list of objects and a search box as the focal point of an online collection? And you know, my, my experience with this so far has been, it's been very difficult to extract the org chart from the collection when it's so deeply embedded into these structures that underlie it. Um, one of the things we deal with is that like all museums, the Princeton University Art Museum has curatorial areas, um, departments in any other vernacular. These for someone who doesn't work in our museum or maybe other museums probably wouldn't make a ton of sense. The divisions are somewhat arbitrary and tied to historical um, implications specific to the institution. So these are this is you know one example that I would have of something like this. Um, I don't know, David, if you have others to jump to. Yeah, I mean, I think for us it is, we've got a curatorial department that manages that. We've got, but the objects take place in the exhibitions that are managed by the registrars. And there's interpretive content generated by that team and there's educational material. And to a user, none of that, those distinctions don't mean anything, but yeah, we wanna say, how do we make, how does this make sense? Not as a series of things, you know, here's the box where the educational content goes because we know who's going to fill that. I mean, I think what we're curious is what have other people seen that were thought about in how do we make this more than just those objects? How do we bring in those other perspectives and but still keep it something that makes sense that isn't, you know, here's the buffet of random things across the museum all put on a page in a contextless way. Um, so if you can, I think we've all done Zoom enough that if you want to do the raise hand thing, we're happy to sort of sequence people that way if people have questions. I will say, David, while we're while we're polling for for the audience here, what, your point about the advanced search also fits very much into this bucket for me, um, because we had the same experience that advanced search was only intuitive to someone who actually already knew a lot about our collections. Um, and we, as part of the process uh, that I described at the beginning, collections 2.0, so to speak, you know, we, we actually sort of undid our advanced search. We, we were able to successfully get rid of it because we promised that people would be able to find things. Um, but, you know, that's, that's still a thing that people talk about. Saskia. Hi, David. Um, hi, Dan. Um, I'm talking here from Amsterdam in the Rijksmuseum. Um, one of the um, option, uh, options that we explored in Amsterdam recently or last year, um, just bef even before Corona uh, started, um, was uh, exploring and using stories as a kind of edited um, conglomerate of all kinds of different objects and uh, uh, editorial content that we put together around objects. So that's that's another way to explore the collection, I guess. I'm, I'm curious, those, sto those stories, were they things entirely generated by the institution or were these sort of, um, did you canvas outside of the institution? Um, that's always something I find interesting. Yeah, it uh, that's that's the the weak point, uh, I guess. Uh, it's it's completely uh, an editorial construction of the own institute, which at the same time was interesting because um, it allowed people to or the institute to uh, add more different perspectives around uh, collection objects. But at the same time, uh, the museum still remained in control of everything, um, which also didn't allow, in my 
personal opinion uh, enough of the outside view and responses. Yeah. Yeah, and I think we certainly also talked about how do we use storytelling because so many of the good stories are these aggregates of, you know, it's objects in context with each other and you can't really do that on an object page. Uh, Jeremy. Uh, hey, uh, nice to see you, Dan and, and David. Um, you know, so something that uh, on the on the, the thread of stories is like, you know, when you go to a museum website, like it, as, as you guys said, it's 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 essentially just a parallel of a database, which is to say you can find things if you know how to find things, right, or if you know what your terms are and stuff. But like that does not that is not the way that like people experience. Um, cultural objects, right? You know, like uh, it, when you go to a physical museum, we have entire discipline of people that put things on walls that tell you like, this is what you get to see today. You only get to see what that, what, the, what what's available there. I know obviously this is all kind of like blunt to all of us, but I like, I like kind of like starting with this, this point. Um, and so like, I wonder like, how, how do we get digital collections to, I, I'm not saying that, I don't think virtual should like represent, just be the physical, because I think, you know, obviously the medium is the message, et cetera. But like, when I think about myself as just like a, a the person managing the database, like my understanding of the collection is very narrative, right? Like I could say like, oh, well, you know, in the sixties, we acquired these types of objects and then the seventies, this new director came on and then we really got into this kind of stuff and blah, blah, blah. And that's not even, that's not even like art historical knowledge or anything. That's just like the experience of the institution. No different than the narrative you would get of like going to a restaurant and then the restaurant is like, well, you know, the owner really wanted to start this restaurant after their travels, wherever, you know, like everybody's got some good narrative, but like museums don't really do, we don't really have that a lot. And I think that's actually some of the more compelling parts of, of collections as an idea, as opposed to discrete objects. That's not really a question, sorry, I don't know. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah. Ranting is also appropriate in these contexts. <laughs> Encouraged even, I think, yeah. <laughs> Erin? Hey, this is, this is great. Um, and I hope this isn't one of your other questions, but when I, or maybe I do. So the longer I work with museum databases, um, the more I think about how fundamentally as a field, we have not moved beyond a card file. The database is a card file. And in order to get to this more rich, like four dimensional experience that you're talking about on the internet, we have to abandon the card file concept um, at institutionally. You know, like I think, I think our public is like way beyond the card file. Um, they're, they want to go on a fun, informational journey where every time they turn a corner there's like a cool thing and then if you it's like choose your own adventure there's many different ways of things to ways to explore the collection and one of the things that i i, I do a lot of work with very small museums and, and one of the things um, i continue to encourage them to do is put less stuff on exhibit right because they put it all out because they want everyone to see all the stuff but explaining to even like an all volunteer run organization or somebody with like a very small staff that you can use one object to tell many different stories as I, as I think sort of the, the way that, you know, I like to think about online collections is that it would be really cool to know how many different exhibitions has this vase been in? How many different ways can you illust, you know, how has this thing contributed to assorted narratives over the hundred years it's been in this collection? Um, and I think the, the fundamental problem there is that sometimes it's contributed to no narratives. And so what about those collection objects where we post them and they're all stubs because they're not related to anything else in our collection? There's also that like um, fear of embarrassment where we, we don't have an encyclopedia entry and a uh, journal article for every object in our collection. 
and I, I think there's a lot of pure curators that really would like that not to be public. <laughs> So I don't know that we could have planted a better segue if we tried, Aaron. So thank you, <laughs> because this the moving on to the next question, and all these questions relate to each other in some way. So people who who still have things to say, like hang out. Um, the next question, just so we can move on a little bit, is this question: user experience and user expectations, and how do collections take advantage of the affordances of the internet? Um, one thing, my my two sentences about this, and then I'll let David talk about it more is I, I can often think about when walking through the museum that these objects exist in the world. They do not exist solely in the context of the museum. And the same, I think, needs to be mirrored in digital collections. They are part of the internet as capital I, something that exists not just within a single web page, but they represent entities of the world. And so their digital representations should also um, engage with that. And I saw someone talk in the chat about linked data, which we can touch on. <laughs> Yeah. <clears throat> and I think, I think if we're thinking about these, these websites as things that live on the internet and are not, you know, one-to-one -one proxies of the museum experience, because they're, honestly, they're really lousy as museums. They're, they're card catalogs, as I think Aaron was saying. Um, what people are going to come to our websites with expectations based on what they have found on the internet already. And I think it is, you know, what are, what do people think? Is it going to, you know, are they looking for something Amazon-like with sort of that massive faceted filtered search so that they can find a particular thing among a, a huge list of other things? Um, do they think of this as sort of like a Google proxy where they ask questions and they get really relevant answers? Um, are they thinking this is sort of a Wikidata, Wikipedia style experience where you're going through narratives and learning and, and sort of jumping from place to place. Um, these, are, these are the experiences that people have online. What can we do and what should we be doing to sort of build on that experience so that it feel, doesn't feel like it's a, it's a book that happened to be put into a bunch of web pages, but that it is an experience that feels like the internet. It doesn't necessarily have to feel like a museum. Uh, Francis. Hi. <clears throat> Sorry, I was just going to say, in my opinion, taking advantage of the affordances of the internet, the first step is that we have to be willing to let go of that control and that authorship and that, that authoritative voice and the fact that we are the interpreters and we have to give other people the opportunities to make the connections and tell stories. And I think it's interesting going off some of the things we've seen in chat around that idea of linking, because I think we also, there's this balance between, we wanna give people the tools to tell stories, but we also want to, you know, there's a, all of the things that, we, uh, you know, sorry, I've mentioned are, are branded is the wrong word, but they are experiences that have a particular set of affordances and feeling that come from an entity. And they are not the definitive, or you know, in Google's case, maybe they are the definitive entity for search. But maybe that's the question is, what do we want to be the definitive entity for? Who do we want to be online? Oh, yeah. that, that exact question, David, that who do we want to be online question is, you know, we probably fulfill collection searches in our lives. And it's a question, do you want the shopping experience? Um, and everything that comes with that, does that fit with the institutional model for how we present things? And this extends to, you know, again, this notion of giving up control and there's giving up control in that, yes, we will let people say things about our collections and we will publish those things. And then there's really giving up control, which is acknowledging that maybe we're not the authoritative voice about everything. You know, we have a, we have a wonderful Monet in our collection. I don't know that we're the authoritative voice about Monet um, necessarily. So how do we represent that? If we, if we can come to that understanding, how do we represent that in an online collection in a way that makes sense to people? Um, these, are, these are the kinds of things. And I think maybe just to jump to that next slide as well, because I think it's the same question, which is really what is the person of the organization? Because what I like to tell people is, you know, 
On the internet, my museum is next door to Dan's museum. We're next door to the Rijksmuseum. We're next door to the Met. Um, we are, in my opinion, the best, you know, fine arts museum on a hill in Brentwood, Los Angeles. We have very little competition in that particular scope. Um, we're not even the only art museum in Los Angeles, but on the internet, we are next door to everyone. And I don't think, you know, there's only going to be one, the best encyclopedic art museum online. There's only going to be one, you know, this. In order to, to, to function online, we need to know who we are and who we wanna be, because, you know, the, the in-person museum experience across museums can be reasonably consistent because you never go, you know, you're, you're not gonna walk out one gallery at Getty and walk into the gallery in Princeton. But we all know that's the experience online is that you are going to do that kind of crossing across boundaries of institutions. And so who do you know who you are? There's, um, there's some talk in the chat. Um, I think Meredith used the term field of dreams, a, a museum online collection, which I think is amazing. But you know, the idea of this, and this is a thing I think about a lot, it, when, in, when it comes to institutional identity and organizational personalities is if we, if we consider the users of our collection and we're honest about the users of our collection, the fact that a work of art is at the Princeton University Art Museum is probably one of the least interesting things about it. And so it's weird that we build our online collection around that aspect of it in so many ways, you know? And riffing off what I'm seeing in the chat, it's also this awkward, we only get to build one collection website and there are millions of potential users and we're not going, you know, I'm often asked to build something for everyone and you can't, you know, that doesn't make any sense. There is no, this is the right thing for everyone. So who is that audience that we as an institution want to reach? Uh, uh, Saskia? Yeah, hi. Um, I think I have a slightly different opinion uh, about that, but um, it mainly comes from the fact that the Rijksmuseum is a national museum, um, which as an authoritative voice can count. Um, um, there is a, a, a clearly defined 19th century concept of museums um, that lies at the heart of um, what this museum uh, and I think a lot of museums does. Um, so I, I think I don't believe in the fact that um, giving up control is something realistic. Um, but maybe that's a European standpoint that I'm not very sure, uh, but I'm kind of doubting whether that is um, that historical perspective and the history of the institutional history that we have is something that we, we can't get rid of. Um, but we can contextualize it and open it up uh, and be more transparent about the biases that we have in the past than I think in the current time as well. Um, for me, I think the, who we want to be um, as, or one of the things that I, being responsible for collection information and data uh, of the, this collection is the fact that I want to um, allow a more plurivocal uh, story and information and data about that collection to, uh, to be as widely accessible as possible. Um, on the internet as well. Uh, I don't know what, th these are ramblings and I've been working all day, so, uh, but still, uh, I think uh, we're working hard um, to put our collections on the internet and to uh, offer that um, on that platform, not necessarily on uh, the platform of a specific museum. Aaron? That's that's a valuable perspective, and I think yeah, this is so. Um, Aaron. 
Yeah, so there's all kinds of great things happening in the chat. Um, but I always ask this question and people people's hair starts on fire when I ask the question. But my, you know, my question about online collections database is why do we put our collections online? And I think it's a it's a it's a question that we we don't actually know the answer to. We do it because we have them. Other museums are doing it. We want to create access, but that's not a very good answer to me. <laughs> like, um, is it more equitable? I don't know. Is it? it would it be cooler to have more tours of storage? I, these are just like, you know, questions. Um, and I, yeah. yeah. Oh, Amanda. Well, I was just gonna say that I think that people do have, at least at my museum, people do have reasons why we put our collections online and they're very disparate and they are not at all equitable at all. <laughs> like, I think that, you know, curators put their collection online, one, to kind of shop it out so that other curators want to use it for their research or put, you know, our objects in their shows, or they want to show the research that they've been doing versus, you know, education wants to center the, you know, classroom materials that they're making and, you know, they want to put those online. And like, overall, there's like the general idea of like, you know, if we hold the collection in the public trust and the public should, should, should have access on it, but is an online platform or at least the ones that we have created, does that actually help the public discover, you know, going back to that idea of centering narratives and centering stories, do we actually communicate that? Um, I would say no. So I, but I, 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 I can't remember who said, I think it might've been David who said like, you know, we're supposed to write for everyone and that's literally impossible. <laughs> there's, there's no way to do that. Um, and I think going back to what you said, Aaron, earlier, where um, museum databases haven't moved past the card catalog. I think that when you think about the way, um, the way we uh, like assume people are going to use the database, um, and that I think that has to tie in with the personnel the organization, organization, right? Um, they think people think that they're just gonna like search and kind of try to pull things up, whereas the collections, you know, collections online and you know internal databases they tend to favor searching over browsing and there's no real way to browse with what we have right now and i think that with how the internet functions now today with like algorithms that are like trying to you know put content together for individual people that's you know our <laughs> the way that museums are pr presenting the collection they definitely don't match with what's kind of going on with the platforms in general. Yeah, and I can't certainly answer, you know, I can tell you the, because this is the conversation that we've had over and over again over the past two years as we've been planning is why are we doing this? Because it is a, there are so many different things we could do and it may or, you know, the answer that we've come to, which is um, we as an institution, because we have physical things, we have unique knowledge about it and being able to provide that out as sort of a, a, a hub of that information is why we have that online. Uh, because we can be the definitive source of information about something. It doesn't mean, but we, that doesn't, is, that is totally different than being the definitive voice about the thing. There's this reference need because research happens online. I mean, none of our curators, and there, we have some old fashioned curators like everyone, you know, they start with Google. Everybody starts with Google for research. And if we're going to participate in the 21st century, we have to be a search result in there. Um, we also know we're never going to be the only search result. There is going to be, for any major work, there's going to be a Wikipedia page that's going to have different opinions. And that's, a, that's fine. And I think a lot of what we're trying to do is how do we make this a site that is as useful as possible for a, a dive deeper link for different experiences across the web that's, I think, what we think when we think of collection line, what we're trying to do um, is to give you that, you know, some, someone should tell a story. And if you want to learn more about the parts of that story, we'd love to be the place where you go for that. And we'll tell some stories, but we can't tell them all. 
you know, the very broad answer to that, David, that we, when we ask ourselves those questions is at the end of the day, we can't be doing it for ourselves. It has to be in the service of some audience need that we have identified and getting distilling down what those audience needs are is incredibly difficult. Um, and when you think you figured it out, often you haven't, and they change over time. And, but at the end of the day, you know, this question of we're doing this because this is just something that museums do when we are a museum is not a good enough of an answer for us, at least. Mm -hmm. So we have about three minutes, if anyone wants to answer this last question here, because neither David nor I have the answer. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know if I can do it in three minutes, but um, I said some of what I think has been coming up in the in the chat and stuff is is something that I've been recently exploring, and that is David White created this model or archetype for for users online, and he has the spectrum of visitors versus residents. Visitors are very much I don't know if anybody else is familiar with this. But visitors visitors very much approach the web as a tool shed. It's a pool of knowledge. We go into our tool shed, we grab what we need and then we put it back. And then you have on the other end of the spectrum, which at any given time, we can slide back and forth and we can live in, in any one of these spaces. On the other end of the spectrum, you have residents, which really tend to live and share online. So that you can think of things like forums or um, social media in particular, where they're they're living their lives out in a communal space on the internet. So you have, you have two, two ends of the spectrum. And I think, what I was saying earlier in the chat, which is where kind of museums are approaching their collections is we're very much treating it as this is this is a pool of knowledge where you come grab your tool and, and use it for academic research. But, but um, I think as somebody else is pointing out is, is that you don't really have these opportunities for discovery. Um, maybe we're conditioned to, you know, really approach the web in terms of search and, and that usually implies that we have an intent of where we're going to uh, land. So I think what might be interesting is to think about what's been brought up um, uh, with the Rights Museum in, in your question, Dan, where you asked um, whether or not users were creating stories about these objects. And that is we start to push to where we look at collections and how they might live in terms of serving a resident of the internet versus a visitor of the internet. And so, you know, where can we create communal spaces where people, you know, have discussions or share stories? And I think that's where you start having those moments of if I'm active in that community, all of a sudden I have these moments of discovery because somebody else has shared a story about their related experience. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I think that's a really good point. And I think at least the perspective that we're coming from is people should have those stories, but they should have them in their existing communities. It's not, you know, I am never going, the Getty is not important enough to, um, to be a hub of a community for anyone, at least in my opinion. You know, that's what Twitter's for. That's what, you know, that's what Ravelry's for. There are communities that exist out there. How can we be a participant in those communities? How can we enable those communities to be communities rather than trying to, create a little side community that is really just for our staff. Um, Dan, do you wanna wrap us up? Yeah, I think that's as good a place as any to wrap this up. Uh, this has been fantastic. This was recorded, I'm, I, the chat will live somewhere. Um, thanks, thanks for everyone who has participated. Thanks to David for going through this with me. Let's keep this conversation going in whatever format we can on Slack, on Twitter, wherever it may be. Um, even if it's just reaching out via email to talk about this more. Um, you know, when we talk about these things openly and in conversation with each other, we make collective progress on them more than we can do otherwise by ourselves. So that's it. Um, thanks so much, everyone. Have a wonderful day. Thank you, Ron.